Have you ever asked yourself why Godfrey, the first Elton Lord, was exiled? Or why it was that Godwin the Golden was the demigod slain in the Night of the Black Knives? Are you curious who Ronnie's teacher, the Cold Witch, really is? I know you have a theory on who Melina truly is. What if I told you I could answer all of these questions? Or that the answers are much more fantastical than you could ever guess? What if I told you that you're not even asking the most interesting question of all? That's okay though, because you're here now. And by the end of this video, you'll have a deeper understanding of the world and more insight into what kind of secrets each mystery may hold. Now, I could just tell you the answers, but you would never believe me. You'd think I was crazy. So before any of that, we need to talk about what has helped lead me and will inevitably help you come to these conclusions. Even before that, though, while this should be obvious, this will be your only warning. I will be covering a lot of Elden Ring's story. I'm going to talk about hidden lore pieces and some, if not all, of the endings. I'm going to talk about theories I have that I haven't seen covered anywhere else. So, if you don't want to be spoiled, you have been warned. While the story is compelling on its own, it's thanks to FromSoft working tirelessly to bring us a game that can convey the story at the highest quality, regardless of what salty developers have to say. This is not From's first Soulsborne game, it's their seventh, and while I personally have some issues with the game, wait, two of them? Why are these things so fucking deadly? Got you little shits. Those complaints don't detract from the credibility as one of the best storytellers in gaming. The quality of their storytelling is taken to new heights in Elden Ring. People know what a FromSoft game is. At this point, they have basically pioneered the Soulsborne game genre. While they are no longer the only developer creating IP in this genre, they are by far the best. And while I may, from time to time, lovingly look at my video game shelf and think of what could have been as I caress one of my favorite childhood games, Armored Core 2, more sexually than the situation calls for, FromSoft isn't the same company it was when it made that game. They release high quality content with each game surpassing the last. Unless you're one of those people who despises Dark Souls 2. Like, okay, it might be the worst in the series, but like, it's at least still faithful to the series on like, other sequels of other series. Their games are known for their skill requirement, even though some of their entities are consistently high completion rate games. I don't know how people can think Bloodborne is unfairly hard when its platinum percentage is at 6.5%. That means 6.5% of people who have played the game not only beat it, but they beat it at least three times. Compare that to an easy game like Lego Harry Potter, where just beating the game once is at 25%. Bloodborne isn't that bad. And most Souls games are like that. Elden Ring is already sitting at 3.9% as of writing this, and it's going up every day. So while the games are technically known for their skill requirement, they are most known for sparking debate about skill requirements in games versus actually requiring a lot of skill. But um, tss. Most importantly, they are known for creating worlds people love to exist in. Places you, you just love coming back to. A place where just being there makes you feel nice and accepted. Like you belong. Of course. I do love you. More than that, though, and all jokes aside, they are known for creating top-notch worlds. While you are progressing and earning the right to exist in the world they've created, you get a sense that the world you are living in hides so much beneath its surface, that it's alive. It seems like an extreme example, but the feeling you get when you're playing a From game is akin to the feeling you get when you're visiting a historical site. You know that ruins in a From game are there for a reason. Ruins in a From game are there because it was a building once. The building had people who used it, and remnants of their existence can still be found. The same way ruins in England have history, so does a From world. I can explain a little bit about what I mean by this with an example. This nugget of information isn't going to be a part of my video, but I want to show you what I mean by the world having something going on underneath. 
inside Rykar the Blasphemous' boss room, you will find this piece of armor. The armor description tells us that it belongs to a henchman of the All-Knowing, one of the tarnish you will be working with throughout the game. Because this armor is found here, we know that this person was likely eaten by Rykard, so he's dead. The fact that the man wearing the armor even made it into this room means he was killing other tarnished. We know that because unless they fought their way through a volcano manor, which is unlikely as the entrance is hidden, and fighting tarnished is the only way you can gain an audience with Rykard. Finally, we know that this man has almost certainly been acting on the All-Knowing's direct orders. So not only are we shown what happened to a specific individual in the world, we now know that the All-Knowing is willing to sacrifice his henchmen and have them kill other tarnished to achieve his goals. While this sounds like a lot to pull from just a piece of armor in a specific location, I want to point out that this is just a basic understanding of what this armor being here means. There might be a specific in-game individual you meet who might allude to who this person was. We rarely receive visitors to the Volcano Manor without invitation. Fascinating. And not unlike another guest we had long ago. Or a specific set of events that we can infer happened because this individual reached this room. Making these connections and understanding what they mean and finally tying them to the other events and circumstances in the greater overarching story, this is what is required to understand lore in a FromSoft game. You aren't just given dispositions so that you can know what's going on. While From's games are without a doubt some of the most compelling stories in video games, most of their fan base doesn't know what the story of most of the games even is. They play the game because they're fun. But just because you've earned the right to exist in their world doesn't mean you've earned the right to understand what's happening behind the scenes. Honestly, working towards understanding the worlds FromSoft created is a much more daunting task than beating the games they've made. There are only a small number of people who dive deep enough into the lore of the games, people like Vadi Vidya and others of his seekers, as well as people like myself. It requires reading item descriptions, listening for seemingly out of place dialogue. You need to look at level design and how that plays into item placement. For example, if you pick up 10 poison cleansing items in a place infested with rot, why did someone have that much poison resistance on them here? Maybe it's because this was a poisonous area before it was a rot infested area. Things like that need to be considered. It's not just what items do, but where you pick them up and how that item got there. It's this attention to detail that's why people love these games. It's why even though their games are considered hard, people love them so passionately. A FromSoft game means that you're getting something that has been tailored every step of the way to enhance the player's experience. Now, while I think that way of creation has suffered due to Elden Ring being a truly open world, while I think that filler inevitably exists, the core of what makes a From game hit so hard is still there, and it's better than ever. So without further ado, let's start digging deep. Like most FromSoft games, most of the action of the world happened well before you put the disc in. However, there needs to be a distinction made before we start this timeline, and it's an important one. The lore of this game isn't the standard lore of a FromSoft game. While the dialogue, text descriptions, and character interactions you see in the game are from FromSoft, and therefore need to be understood from a FromSoft perspective, the lore of the world is a George R. R. Martin creation. The reason for this important distinction is because when breaking down the hidden aspects of a story, we rely on imagining what the person writing it would be thinking when they put forward the scenario we are reading. Normally, with a From game, that means understanding what Miyazaki would make happen in this scenario. Now, it means understanding what George R.R. R. Martin would do. So basically, way more <clears throat> family relations. <coughs> When you start the game, you're thrown in the middle of nowhere, maidenless. The only thing you know is that you're supposed to get the Elden Ring. But what is the Elden Ring? Why do you need to get it? Why are you here? Well, before all that, we should start at the beginning. More aptly, before the beginning. Before time itself. Dragons ruled over the lands in between. You had the Borealis dragons taking dominion in the north. The mother of dragons, Grail located in the south, 
and the true first Elden Lord, Dragon Lord Placidu, ruled over all from his throne in Faramazula. While their powers seemed eternal, they were free and not chained by any of the outer gods, and this proved their undoing. First, giants arrived, taking over the north with the help of the one-eyed god. They ransacked and all but wiped out the Borealis dragons. After they secured the north, the largest of their numbers marched over the ocean to the south to kill the mother of dragons. However, this is where they lost the majority of their forces strength. They sent out the largest of the giants to kill the mother of dragons, as they were the only ones who could safely cross the ocean to the south. But while in the Northlands they had the advantage thanks to the one-eyed god's fire, they had to pass by Faramazul on their way to Grail. And this is where the war ended. Throughout Kaelid, you can see where the largest of the giants died, their skulls littering the land. With this, the north went from a stronghold to a prison when they were cursed to be the bearers of the one-eyed god's flame for all eternity. After these events, human beings inhabited the lands between. The astronomers moved into the west, and some other cities settled around Faramazula. Grail still birthed dragons to the south, and the dragon lord still ruled his throne in the center of the continent. This was generally a peaceful time. The astronomers considered the giants as neighbors, and the dragons were willing to leave the humans alone. That is, until another outer god decided to run amok. The outer god Estelle decided to lay waste to several cities in the world. Estelle brought down the dark moon and buried several cities of humanity in the south. Little is known about this, but Estelle decided to take the sky away from the cities of Nakron. Another event that happened shortly after the fall of the Dark Moon was the outer god called the Greater Will sent a star-bearing beast down to the lands between. I believe this beast to be the Elden Beast. Little is known about the actions of this beast, but several things happen in some order during this time. Marika, a new man, arrives. Marika receives the Elden Beast's power in the form of the Elden Ring. She contains it inside of her and becomes the goddess of the lands between. The Erd Tree is planted and becomes a symbol of the Golden Order. And Farron Azula gets displaced from the center of the continent and floats to the east in a maelstrom of wind. I do not know if it was Marika, Azula, or the Elden Beast that caused Farron Azula to become displaced. The reason I do not know is because the Beastmen are the primary inhabitants of Farron Azula now, meaning that they were likely there when it was displaced. The Beastmen clergyman is Marika's half-brother, so she was likely around when it got displaced. However, while the war did eventually break out between the dragons and the Golden Order, it wasn't until the Golden Order was at the peak of their power and the dragon started the assault on the Golden Order, so I don't believe Marika was responsible for the displacement of Faramazula, but I could be wrong. Either way, for the purposes of this video, it isn't important, and I'm sure someone will figure it out eventually. With this, we are now moving from the age before time to the Golden Order's Golden Age. During this time is when Marika rose to power. Several key events happened during this time. The first is that Marika took on Godfrey to be her consort, proclaiming him the first Elden Lord. Those of you who are actually paying attention will likely realize that Godfrey is not the first Elden Lord. And the true first Elden Lord, Dragon Lord Placidu, ruled over all. Now there are two potential reasons for this. One is the Dragon Lord exists outside of time, so is he really the first if he's not technically in the timeline? But I think the actual answer is the first glimpse into the darkness of the goddess Marika. I believe Marika cared more about her power than any before, and while yes, technically the Dragon Lord was the first Elden Lord, she was the one true goddess, so her Elden Lord was the first true Elden Lord. Now while we see the Golden Order as the dominant power of the land during the events of the game, at the start of this period that is not the case. While the South was decimated by the recent attacks, Marika had no problem claiming the new land as her own. While the land wasn't hard to claim, there were those who would fight against the new common Golden Order. The Golden Order's most deadly foes, the Fire Giants, the fire giants were Marika's main worry, because even though they were a shell of what they had once been, they were the only ones who had access to something that could hurt her, the one-eyed god's fire. So she waged war with her consort Godfrey. They fought and killed the giants, locking down the one-eyed god's fire so it could never be used against them. During the series of events, Godfrey and Marika had three children, Godwin, Morgoth, and Mog. Morgoth and Mog were considered omens, horned individuals who are said to be cursed and bringers of bad omens. 
America despised these two, and Morgoth spent his life working for the Golden Order, even though no one in the Golden Order had any love for him. It's around this time that the sorcerers of Raya Lucaria were seen as the next threat of the Golden Order. The astronomers of old had eventually evolved into the sorcerers of the Academy. Renala had shown the astronomers the power of the moon and had became their leader. As I said earlier, the astronomers once saw the giants as their neighbors, and with the new Golden Order taking them out, they had begun getting ready for war. This is when Radigan was deployed to annex their lands into the Golden Order. Radigan was Queen Merica's male half. It is believed by some that Radigan is a separate body of Merica, but I think it's possible that Radigan never split from Merica, and Merica was absent during the time Radigan was away. This is important for later, so please remember it, because there are two theories tied to this depending on which is true. While Radigan was out conquering the land Renala ruled over, he fell deeply in love with her, becoming her consort immediately and praying for forgiveness. This led to the Academy joining the Golden Order and Renala and Radigan having three children, Rani, Radon, and Rikard. Radon took up war against the stars, halting the progression so they no longer ruled the land. Rani would study under the tutelage of the Cold Witch, and Rikard would become Lord of Mount Galnir. What happens next is extremely important, and when I start proposing information that is spectacular in nature. Godfrey was banished from the lands between, becoming the first tarnished. The reason why is unclear, but I have two theories for this. The first theory is that Mog was born in Ullman, and Marika, disgusted by this, banished her Elden Lord. This plays into the arrogance and self-love of Queen Marika, and it also ties in best with the story as is in Elden Ring. But I believe there is another reason for his banishment, and I don't think you're ready for it. This is where I said that understanding the author of the story matters. While little things like this can happen in Miyazaki's story, family fracturings have deep meaning in George R.R. R. Martin's works. I believe Godfrey discovered that Mog and Morgoth weren't Mararka and his children, although they were his blood. I believe they were Mararka and Godwin's children. This plays into what I had spoken about earlier. I think Godfrey discovered that Marika had been conceiving children with their son, and he was banished because of it. Godwin could act as Marika during her absence as Radigan, which will be very important later, so note that I believe Godwin can take the form of Marika. But once Godfrey was sent away, she would be needed more than ever, so she came back immediately. This marks the start of our next phase in the timeline, the downfall of the Golden Order. Radigan is back in the capital as Elden Lord, and he and Marika have the twins Mikola and Melania. While neither of them are born as Omen, they are both cursed all the same. Mikola was cursed to be forever young, and Melania was cursed to be the god of rot. I want to point out that if my theory about Marika and Radigan being one body is true, it's likely that these twins are not the product of Marika and Radigan nor are they the product of Marika and Godfrey, else they would be omens. I believe they are the children of the female version of Godwin and Radigan. While they weren't born as omens, they were cursed all the same. I believe this is how Marika got around the omen curse, and why they share a much stronger connection to Radigan and even Godwin than they do with Marika. This is the last and most peaceful time in the Golden Order. The only war fought during this time was when Rikard blasphemed. I believe this happened before the fracturing because after the fracturing most soldiers would have lost their minds, and it's clear that they have a massive battle between the capital and Rikard. During this time Mog had met with the Mother of Truth, setting him on the path to be the Lord of Blood. It's also during this time that Mikola's story takes place. I will talk about Mikola more in depth later in the video though, but I should cover him here shortly. Mikola was a key player in the Lands Between's trajectory. Mikola started out looking for a way to fix his and his sister's curses with the uncanny ability to make everyone he met like him dearly. He eventually grew the Hallig Tree and joined with it to try and break the curse of him forever being a child. Before that though, several of the two fingers, heralds of the greater will, would choose three different gods as successors to Queen Marika, Rani, Mikola, and Melania. However, this is the event that doomed the Golden Order. At this point, Mikola had come to understand that the Golden Order was lost, and the Greater Will needed to be upended. Melania was already affected by an Outer God, and even more than that believed in her brother, Mikola, more than herself, so she would never take the throne from him. 
and Ronnie also lost hope in the Golden Order. While Mikola was trying his own actions to subvert the Golden Order's rule, with Melania acting as his blade, Ronnie wanted to rule, but didn't want to under the greater will. So she took matters into her own hands. It's now that I want to point out the effect the greater will had on reality itself. The Elden Ring dictated the laws of reality in the lands in between. Each greater rune had certain laws connected to them. To the point where Marika removed the rune of death from the Elden Ring, thereby sealing away the power to truly kill anyone in the land between. She had given this power to her half-brother Maleketh and used him as an executioner of sorts, sending him out to kill key opposers like the Glomide Queen. Knowing this, Rani set up a plan to get a piece of the Rune of Death and etch it into the blades to kill different demigods. This is called the Knight of Black Knives, and I will talk about it more in depth when I cover Rani later. But she killed Godwin's soul and her body. She did this so that she could escape from the influence of the Greater Will. The loss of Godwin drove Marika mad, and she shattered the Elden Ring. I believe for a while Marika had been obsessed with herself and forsaken the Golden Order. When her lover and child Godwin was slain, she blamed the Greater Will for this, so she shattered the Elden Ring. This event was known as the Shattering and is believed to be what led the demigods to war with one another to be the next Elden Lord. This is also when Mog stole Mikola from the Halleck Tree and when the game begins. This is the history of Elden Ring through my eyes and everything important that takes place before the start of the game. I know it's a lot to take in and I could very well be wrong about pieces of it, but I'm almost positive most of what I've said is the case. I've read every item description and looked into multiple locations writing down the key points of what I've read during that time, paying attention to where and what was found, thinking about people's motivations from George R. R. Martin's perspective. While I have come to theories that the game directly contradicts, I believe the intention of the game contradicting you is because that's what Marika purposely hides from the rest of the world. To me, while I was playing, Godwin dying never made sense, neither did Godfrey's dismissal. Also, Godwin was mostly absent from any lore, and I couldn't figure out why that would be. These circumstances I have put forth made everything fit into place for me, and will make more fit into place as I talk later in the video. Some of the evidence for me is the Black Knife assassins. The Black Knives, the people who killed Godwin, were Newman, the same race as Merica. Not only that, but it's explicitly said that anyone who is close to America, even who seems to have any deep insight in America, wants her dead, is directly related to her, or is terrified of what she has planned. Nothing the game explicitly tells you happened makes sense as to why that would be the case. So even if I'm not 100% on the mark, there's so much more to America and the end of the Golden Order than is presented in the game as of now. What a wild ride. So many YouTube algorithm unfriendly family relations going on. Maybe I'm looking too deep into the fact that Mr. R.R. Martin wrote it, but the storyline just makes sense to me. So why don't I just end the video here? Well, my little wings, that's because we're just getting started. There's still a few more important secrets that the story is hiding. Before I can get into them, I need to talk about Ronnie the Witch. Ronnie was Renala and Radigan's daughter. So she has the blood of Merica running through her veins directly. First, I want to talk about a popular fan theory I don't think is accurate. There are a group of people who believe Ronnie and Melina are the same person. The reason for this is because of the eye business, and that they kind of look similar. That maybe Melina is a separation between Ronnie, similar to Radigan and Merica. First, I truly believe there is no separation between Merica and Radigan, so I don't think that would be the case. Even if Radigan and Merica are separated, Ronnie and Melina are unlikely to be the same. I say this because Ronnie looks nothing like Melina. Now, a lot of you are disagreeing strongly with me. I want to point out to you that you aren't looking at Ronnie. You're looking at Ronnie's teacher, the Cold Witch. When Ronnie was alive, she looked just like her mother. The children you see in the fight with Renala are reincarnations of Ronnie. Renala is making them because she thinks her daughter is dead. However, these are what Ronnie originally looked like, not anything like the Cold Witch or Melina. If you still don't believe me, I will talk about who Melina actually is later, but I choose to talk about Ronnie first because it adds suspense, and honestly, waifu for laifu. Just kidding, hashtag Team Millicent. 
So Rani starts her life as the child of Renala and Radigan. She was raised as a Carrion princess. She had other sisters assumably born of Renala and her previous consort, but as time went on, they died, and honestly are not important to what I'm trying to convey. She grew up as the ward of E.G. the blacksmith troll, and overall, she had a good start to her life. As she grew up, Renala's attentions were directed at her husband rather than her children, only switching to her children once Radigan left her to be the second Elden Lord. Instead, E.G. acted as her father, and she took the Dusk-Eyed Queen as her mother figure. I know, I know, a lot of you are going to tell me that the Dusk-Eyed Queen was able to control fire, so she can't be the cold witch, references Ronnie's teacher, and you're both right and wrong. The Dusk-Eyed Queen has two names, and I've already used both of them in this video. The Dusk-Eyed Queen and the Glow-Eyed Queen. These are two different names given to the same person, and are both used to refer to the leader of the Gonskin Apostles. What I need you to understand, though, is that Gloam is synonymous with Twilight, not just Dusk. Twilight is the two times as night turns to day and day turns to night. So if we look at it like that, dawn is the time as night turns to day. This is the power over fire and the power of the Godskin Apostles. Her other known name, Dusk, is the time after day. This would be the power of chill. It's curious that she would be called the Dusk-Eyed Queen if she wasn't the Chill Witch, because you could easily call her the Dawn-Eyed Queen, or just the Gloam Queen. I feel like it's clarified that she has two names so you understand she has two powers. So yes, I believe the Dusk-Eyed Queen had the power over cold and the power of the Black Fire. And the reason Ronnie knows her as the Cold Witch can be seen just by looking at the appearance of her doll. Her new doll-like appearance has the right eye closed. This is the eye that would be the gloam eye, the dusk eye remaining open. This alludes to the fact that the dusk-eyed queen taught Rani while using her cold powers. I will talk about the dusk-eyed queen more during Melina's section. It is no wonder that Rani became skeptical of a greater will when her teacher was adeptly aware of the inner workings of it and went out of her way to raise an army meant to kill the demigods. I didn't talk about the queen or the history of the lands between because she's an integral part of these two stories. But the reason Merica took the Rune of Death out of the Elden Ring is because of the Glomide Queen was waging a successful war against her. We don't know much about the Glomide Queen because Merica didn't want people to know about her. The only place you can learn anything about her is from the Godskin Apostles equipment and spells or the magic and weapons she is known for. I think it's telling that the first time Erica ever effectively started a shattering was when she pulled the death rune out of the Elden Ring. And this was in direct response to the Glomide Queen. And yet she's never talked about virtually anywhere. This stinks of Merica silencing any chatting about her. You can also assume that anywhere you find a godskin individual she had an effect on. You find one in front of Rani's body, one at the bottom of Radan's Divine Tower, and some others in Faramazula. These are very important locations in the world, and they're just existing there. While I'm not going to break down the initial clash with Merica, I will say that I definitely believe the Dusk-Eyed Queen was the Snow Witch and that Rani saw her as a mother figure. So Rani learns from her teacher and acquired a distaste for the greater will. It is around this time that the fingers quote unquote bless her with the ability to be a successor of the Elden Ring and a potential candidate of the next goddess of the greater will. This is when Blythe was given to her and when she begins to hatch a plan. If you have doubts of who Rani's teacher was, you should remember that Rani suddenly had a very good understanding of death. I don't think the knowledge of how to pull off a situation like that or the ability to understand death so fundamentally that she could kill a soul and a body separately was one she gained alone. But it was something someone like Fia could understand only after knowing what happened. However, Fia is one who lived in death, and the only person who really fits that description would be the Dusk-Eyed Queen. It's easy to attribute knowledge to characters, but you have to remember and ask, how did someone gain that knowledge? Ronnie was able to gain the trust of people very close to America. She had an intense understanding of death and was able to attach her soul to a doll. Now these could be things she did single-handedly or something she received help with. I believe the intricate knowledge of death comes from her teacher. So she decides to enact the Night of Black Knives, but it happened differently than we are led to believe. The reality of the Night of Knives is that Godwin is killed in soul, but the body was left alive. Why though? Why would Ronnie 
do that? Or rather, what reasons would the Dusk Eye Queen have for doing that? Was it to cause Merica to shatter the Elden Ring? Perhaps. Maybe the goal was to hurt Merica, but this doesn't seem like how the Dusk Eyed Queen or Ronnie do things. So I actually think there's a good reason Godwin was killed, and you already know it. I want to say outright that I don't think Ronnie was planning on the shattering happening. I don't think anyone was. That was not the goal of the Night of the Black Knives. And this backed up by the initial cinematic trailer when she says this line. What could the demigods ever hope to win? And I believe that's a real question. What reason do the demigods have to fight? There aren't any. If we approach this logically, Godwin was the one whose soul was slain. So with that being said, there are two possibilities. Either Godwin was her target or he wasn't. Yes, he was slain. But was that intentional or an accident? Sure, we see the black knives holding Godwin as they cut into his flesh. So first, let's go down the road and say it was intentional. With everything we know in the game, that doesn't make sense. Godwin is basically a nobody. But if he was actually the true consort of Merica and Radigan, it would make at least some sense. However, in the game, Ronnie isn't really that well off because of Godwin's death. She doesn't seem like she was ready for the shattering. And honestly, killing her flesh didn't help her or the Dusk Eyed Queen very much. Sure, Ronnie was able to escape the Golden Order, but she ended up needing to kill her fingers anyway. I think she assumed the Black Knives would return so that she could finish off her fingers. But they didn't. The thing is, when you commit a coup, it's something that you plan out so that when the dust settles, you're standing on top. Granny, however, does not end up on top. In fact, she's basically nothing. She only has E.G., Blythe, and Celevis. Most of the Black Knife assassins are dead or worse. The Knight of Black Knives doesn't seem like it went well with Ronnie, which makes the second possibility much more likely. She didn't mean to kill Godwin. I think Godwin would stand in as Merica when she was acting as Radigan. I think Ronnie would plan to attack Merica when Radigan wasn't near. So the only time she would think of assassinating Merica is when Merica was actually Godwin because she would have to be sure Radigan was somewhere else. I think the plan was to kill Queen Merica's soul, thereby leaving the goddess as a husk holding the Elden Ring alive and destroying the soul controlling it. This would effectively hamstring the Golden Order. The Elden Ring still has a host, but no will to control its power. It would make becoming the next goddess trivial. With that being the case, why would Godwin be killed? Surely after the Black Knives assassins realized they were killing Godwin, they would have stopped, right? Wrong. Because if the Black Knives had stopped, then Ronnie would have died a true death. Remember, they had to kill Merica's soul at the exact same time they killed Ronnie's body, or Ronnie would have died a true death. So even though the Black Knives realized what was happening, they could do nothing else besides finish the deed. This is why Godwin was killed during the Night of the Black Knives. This is why Merica was so distraught after Godwin was slain. This is one of the main reasons Ronnie is in the state we see her in at the start of the game. And this is one of the reasons the demigods had to fight. After the Night of Black Knives, Ronnie is decrepit. She has not toppled the Golden Order. She has no way of killing her fingers. She can't reveal her plan for fear that the demigods would side with Merica, so she waits until she hears of Torrent. This is when she arrives in the game, but we'll talk about that more later, because we need to talk about someone else before we can go further into the story. While I was able to tell a nice story for Rani, I have to be more blunt with Melina because there's just less of a timeline to go on. I'm not going to sugarcoat it at all. Melina is 100% connected with the Glomide Queen. This connection is obvious with the frenzied flame ending. The woman who appears at the end is 100% the Glom slash Dusk Eyed Queen in the flesh. Now, for some of you, that means Melina is the Glomide Queen, but I want to point out that this just means that Melina could be the Glomide Queen. In layman's terms, while I'm saying we see someone who looks like Melina show up at the end, and I am saying I definitely believe that person we see is Glomide Queen's flesh, I do not believe it is Melina. I'm not out here saying random shit either. It's not for shock value, I'm not trying to be edgy. I just think her being the Glomide Queen is far too simple an explanation for what's happening in the Frenzied Fire ending. 
Remember, unless this is just a setup for DLC or a future game, this is the ending of the story. Knowing Melina is the Glomide Queen doesn't do anything for our story. It doesn't add any intrigue or insight into what happened in the game. It's just a weird twist no one wanted either meant to sell DLC or a sequel, and I don't believe that's what the reveal was meant to do, and there's evidence to back this up. Earlier I talked about the Dusk Eyed Queen and the Glomide Queen being technically the same person, but having different powers. You can see the left eye is blue here, much like the doll Ronnie resides in's blue left eye. This would mean that the power associated with her Dusk Eye is the power of cold. Melina is connected to the power of the Glomide Queen the obviously faded right eye. I think the Glomide Queen is Melina's mother, and while I'm not sure there is a true difference between the Dusk-Eyed Queen and the Glomide Queen, I believe the Glomide Queen is the one who led Godskin Apostles, tying Melina's powers to that of the Black Fire, and coinciding with her ability to act as the Kindling Maiden. I said a moment ago that I believe the Glomide Queen is Melina's mother. However, I think she is Melina's mother the same way Melania is Millicent's mother. If you look at the difference between the Glomide Queen and Melina, you'll notice all of the same features are there, but slightly different. The hair is a different color. The left eye has the markings, but in Melina they are filled in with a black sort of inky looking thing, while they are more scar tissue in this one. The burns on the hands are still there, and likely the most noticeable of all, her right eye is faded, while Melina's is clearly still vibrant. Now, there is another theory for this, that this is her main body and Melina is a spirit trying to get into it, but was stopped by the thorns or some other force. This theory would mean that her spirit just doesn't have the same wear and tear that the physical form does. I don't think that's right though, because it means your earlier encounters with Melina wouldn't make much sense because she's the Glomide Queen. Not to be that guy, but would anyone have really not helped her if we had known who she was? It's not like we're ever told anyone we meet about her. The only person we had who had any idea of her existence is Shabriri, and that's something for another time entirely. So why would she lie to us? I mean, we're willing to go to the Frenzied Flame on a whim, like we care if she wants to kill the demigods. No, Melina plays the part of an innocent naive girl, and I think she actually embodies that part well. While Melina knows who her mother is and her role in freeing her from the Erd Tree, I don't think she is her mother. Now, this is the theory I'm least sure of. So I don't want to put too much stock into Melina not being the Glomide Queen. As for the most part, my evidence is pretty circumstantial. I think overall this isn't one of the more important theories in this video either. I just know that it's a hot talking point and I wanted to give my two cents if a definitive answer is never found. I am sure though that she is connected to the Glomide Queen. And actually I have definitive evidence that the Cold Witch is the Dusk Eyed Queen as well. At the time of writing this, the only place there is literally any discussion about this key player is on the literal wiki page. But Torrent is kind of a big clue to answering the world's secrets, don't you think? Torrent is accompanying Melina at the start of the game, and Ronnie also knows about Torrent, and at the behest of its previous master, gives you a spirit bell. I have two theories of who Torrent's previous master is, but the most likely one is the Dusk-Eyed Queen. That ring you see her grasp in the Frenzy Fired ending, that's Torrent's spirit caller ring. I think this points to her being the previous owner of Torrent. I think this makes it obvious that the Glomide Queen either had a mastery of spirits or knew someone who did have a mastery of spirits. So her creating her daughter Melina as a spirit offshoot of herself seems likely. She gave a spectral steed to Melina to be able to get around its spirit form, and she told Ronnie if she should ever find someone who was worthy to ride Torrent that she should bequeath the spirit calling bell on them. This fact is also more evidence that Melina is not the Glomide Queen. Because while the Glomide Queen trusted Torrent's judgment enough to tell Ronnie to give the Spirit Caller's bell to whoever was on top of it, Melina is skeptical of you, saying she only followed Torrent's lead and pretended to trust you. So while that trust is shared between the Dusk Eyed Queen and Torrent, it's not the same for Melina and Torrent. And with that, the story of Ronnie and Melina is solved thereby showing you the character you play is actually an albinoric husk housing Mikola's soul. Wait, what did he say? 
What the fuck? Well, it's time to dislike the video, leave an anger comment, and book. I was willing to listen to this motherfucker's crockpot theory on mother and son relations, but the main character being Mikola, this man has lost his damn mind. He can't possibly back this up. Well, of course I can. But first, I should probably talk about Mikola, as I have obviously skipped over his story to talk about it here. Mikola is the son of Radigan and Merica. Or, if my theories hold true, he is the son of Radigan and the female Godwin. His sister is Melania, and they were both cursed at birth. Melania was cursed as the goddess of rot, having the rot festering inside of her, and Mikola was cursed to forever be a child. They also had their blessings too. Melania was the ultimate warrior. While she wielded a blade, none could best her. The only individual who was her equal in combat was Radon. This is incredibly important to what's been going on with Mikola. While Radon has his own separate storyline about his deeds holding back the stars and his idolization of Godfrey and Radigan, one of his main functions in the story is to show how powerful Melania is. Knowing the deeds of Radon and having him fight her to a standstill shows how strong she is. Why is that so important, you might ask? Because she's twins with Mikola, and Mikola's intellect is rival to Melania's strength. He crafted items that allowed people to fight off the influence of the Outer Gods, and he created a tree on his own that was rival to the Erd Tree. We are to believe it failed, but I think it actually served its exact purpose. Knowing that Mikola is the most intelligent being is important, and believing everything I've discussed up until now, we can truly break down the most amazing character in the game, Mikola. As said multiple times before, Melania and Mikola were born cursed, and Mikola's sole goal was to undo these curses. However, we didn't talk much about why they were cursed, even though I've heavily implied it before. When Merica was birthing Godwin's children, they all came out as omens. So they tried to make Radigan the father and Godwin the mother, but it ended up with them being cursed instead of omens. I think Mikola figured out this as well. I think Mikola realized what was going on inside of his family, and that's why he's shown to have affection for his father and his brother, but not for Merica. It is shown that in his earlier years, he loved the Golden Order and his father, and showered his father with newer and stronger incantations. By the time his father gave him an incantation as a gift, Mikola is shown to have lost faith in the Golden Order, and it's said that it's because the Golden Order couldn't help him, but I believe it's because he understood that it's the Golden Order that was causing him to be cursed. This would be about the time the Halleck tree would have begun to grow. Mikola would spend his time growing this, and it was believed he was trying to grow it to be a new Erd tree, and use it to get rid of his curse. We are led to believe he failed and died. Obviously, I don't agree with this. So let's talk about what happened when he planted the Halleck tree. The first is that the tree grew into a huge tree. It grew so big that it was able to contain an entire fort. And the fort contained a race of artificially created beings, the Albinorics. These Albinorics are said to be soulless. Now, it's not clear who created the Albinorics, but it was clear they viewed the Halleck tree as a safe haven. They are still protecting the Halleck tree even now. I want to point out while we don't know who initially created them, it's clear Mikola perfected them. All of the knights surrounding the Halleck tree are Albinorics. Even Melania's most trusted and faithful knight is an Albinoric. And these are perfect representations of humanity. They are still protecting the Halleck tree even today. And not only that, they are the most pristine representations of any life in the current world. Even their armor is the only armor that has yet to lose its vigor and shine in the Age of the Shattering. This is how Mikola created you, or at least your character. He created a tarnished of no renown to house his soul. One thing I didn't mention in Ronnie's section is that the Dusk Eyed Queen would have been killed by Malekith at this point. However, it's clear she isn't completely dead, but instead imprisoned in the Erd Tree. One of Mikola's plans for the Halleck Tree was to use it to communicate with the Dusk Eyed Queen. There are a few pieces of information I have that make me believe this is the case. The first is that one of the Black Knight assassins is protecting the entrance to the Halleck Tree. Mikola was not one of the marks for assassination. So what is one doing all the way out here? 
The other ones are found in locations that make sense. Near Marika's bedchambers, near the capital, near Ronnie's main base. But this one's placement doesn't. However, when you think about it from the perspective of Mikola was helping Ronnie and the Dusk Eyed Queen, it makes more sense. But I guess there isn't any evidence that Mikola would help them, right? What could the demigods ever hope to win by foreign? What reasons do the demigods have to fight? This question matters more than you initially thought. And in fact, when you realize that there are only two recorded fights between demigods in the entire game, the first being the killing of Godwin by Ronnie, and that has a huge amount of significance. What makes you think the second one was just two powerful players facing off? Because, because that's what was implied by the opening? No, that's a smoke screen. This will likely be people's first that's weird moment while playing this game. Melania has no reason to fight Radon. She never showed any desire to become a goddess. And in fact, the only thing she shows any desire to do the entire game is the overwhelming desire to do right by Mikola. And why would fighting Radon be the only thing that falls outside of this desire? So we can surmise that Melania was acting under Mikola's orders when fighting Radon. But to what end? What could Mikola possibly gain from killing Radon? It seems like the only person who has anything to gain from Radon's death would be Ronnie. Thing is, we don't associate this with Melania's actions because not even Ronnie herself knew of that. So before even Ronnie knew Radon needed to fall, Mikola was already setting things into motion to make it happen. This is what leads me to believe he was working with the Dusk-Eyed Queen. And the only way he could be doing that is to be communicating with her in the tree. But okay, so he might want to work with the Dusk-Eyed Queen. But why would she want to work with him? Something I failed to mention until this point is one of Mikola's most pronounced powers. He had the power of adoration. He could make anyone he met adore him. Whether this power was completely divine isn't known, but it's referenced several times in the game. So while the Dusk-Eyed Queen may have not necessarily wanted to help Mikola, Mikola could have persuaded her in his own way. So whether you're convinced or not, there is at least one reason to suspect Mikola was in some way trying to help Ronnie. However, there is something we didn't talk about in Ronnie's story that I believe Mikola was the main influence behind. So let's get into that now. At this point, Mikola knows he will never cure his or his sister's curses as long as they exist in their current form. So instead of giving up, he uses this information to his advantage. Instead of trying to find a way to grow his current body, he finds a way to grow a new one. This will require a different set of skills than removing a godly curse. Instead, it will require transferring his living soul into another host. That means he will need to sever his soul from his current flesh and then, without damaging the soul, imprint it onto a new host without negative side effects. And most importantly, making sure the curse is no longer active. I know at this point many of you are just into this story and you like where I'm going, but for those of you who aren't, I have evidence he did all of this. First, we see him working to give soulless flesh life. We see this in the Castle of Soul. It is assumed here that he is trying to give Godwin his soul back, but there is no evidence of this. In fact, there is evidence to the contrary. I have been showing an item description or two, but I haven't been reading from them specifically because it would usually take more explanation to get across. But there is an item description for the Golden Epitaph. This is the sword that was made to commemorate what happened to Godwin. And in it, we have what we believe to be Mikola's words. Oh, brother, Lord, brother, please die a true death. If these words are Mikola's, this is heavy evidence that he doesn't want to resurrect his brother. So who is he trying to give a soul? Second, we know that Mikola did separate his soul from his body. This is basic information in the game. But we are led to believe the Lord of Blood stole Mikola's body from the Halleck Tree, but the soul still resides in the Halleck Tree. More on this in a little bit. The last thing he did was test the process before doing it on himself. Now, some of you may think it's the Albanorix he tested this on, but it was Rani. Rani is the first example of a demigod removing her soul from her flesh and attaching it to a new host. How did she figure out how to do this? I'm not saying Ronnie isn't intelligent, but how did she come to the conclusion that she needs to remove her flesh from her soul? 
Did she spend her entire life trying to figure out how to get rid of the greater world's influence? There isn't too much evidence of that. It seems she decided to do this when she was chosen as an Empyrean by the Two Fingers. Isn't it more likely that it was suggested to her? That she was led to believe she could escape it by separating her soul from her flesh. This was Mikola's test run. This is how he saw if it would work. And he saw it was a partial failure, at least for his purposes. Ronnie's curse followed her soul, not her flesh. Remember, Ronnie still needed to kill her two fingers. Also, there were negative effects as well, as told to us from Ronnie herself. I shall soon enter my slumber, and it will be some time before I wake. This doll's body is not without its hindrances. This is not how Mikola would want to escape his curse. So, once he understood what needed to be done, he did it. What follows is what I believe is the answer to curing his curse. He entered the Halleck Tree and then separated his soul from his body. It is believed separating the body from the soul killed Mikola and the Halleck Tree because it stopped growing. But I believe this was his intention from the start. Even Mikola's body can be seen to have kept growing after losing the soul in the Lord of Blood's chambers. The arm in this cutscene is shown to be much smaller than the Lord of Blood himself, but in his chambers it's shown to be huge. Now, Mikola might have actually wanted to put his soul back into his body, but I don't think he wanted to risk accidentally getting the curse back. Those of you who remember what I was saying about the curse following the body might think that's pointless to do anything because the curse just follows the soul. While I didn't actually say the curse followed the soul, I said it followed Ronnie's soul instead of her body. Ronnie's soul was where the curse still resided, but I believe the curse resided within her memories. So after Mikola severed his soul and memories from his body, he placed his memories in a catalyst that had grown up from his flesh for millennia, the Halleck Tree. I believe this is why the Halleck Tree stopped growing, not because it died, but because now it houses his curse. Mikola could have gone back to his body, and maybe that was even his initial intention. I believe he had set up a tarnished albinoric to house his soul in the west coast of the Lands of the Mist where he killed the maiden that was to be his link to the greater will and instead relied on the Glomide Queen to give him a maiden that could offer no guidance. Remember, the Glomide Queen only had one requirement for helping someone, finding someone Torrent took a liking to, and Mikola had the uncanny ability to get people to like him. It's also referenced that all spirits are attracted to you. In fact, it's referenced by in-game NPCs that you just have this Thing that makes people want to trust you. I know you've got what it takes. Not only are you a superb fighter, but people want to trust you. I've seen it. So in some ways, it seems like the Glomide Queen knew who Torrent would want to serve. Maybe she told Torrent never to find anyone, but he was undoubtedly attracted to Mikola. I don't know. The other potential owner I mentioned earlier is Mikola. While I think it's less likely, Melina's clothes are found outside of the roots of the Halleck Tree. So maybe Mikola gave Torrent and told her to trust his gut without telling her why, when he knew Torrent would recognize him no matter where he was. As the game goes on, everyone trusts and believes in you, and that's fucking weird. Like, these games aren't usually like that. And even Patches does his patented betrayal. He doesn't actually just leave you, he gives you advice to be wary of Volcano Manor. Then stay away from the Volcano Manor! <laughs> if you skip all interactions, you can still straight up walk into Volcano Manor and Ronnie's place, and they will just straight up offer you to join them. This is ridiculous and not good design unless there's a reason they would trust you like this. There is this sense that you're too good to be true, and I mean to their credit, you do become the Elden Lord, but realistically even fucking Gideon and the Dung Eater grow attached to you. Do you understand how much these characters don't do that? It's literally kind of their thing. Even Melania, as she perishes, believes you are worthy of being a lord. <laughs> And the only person she would ever think that of is Mikola, which she has no problem reminding you over and over again as she kicks the shit out of you. I, am Blade of I want to point out that she doesn't die either. 
She blooms into a flower that the main character uses to insert another needle into. There's more to the end of the story than I'm explaining here, but I believe wholeheartedly that Mikola ends up saving her too. But this is it. This is the story of Elden Ring, and it kicked fucking ass, dude. The truth is, I don't watch any videos on any of the games I do a video about until I finish my video about them. The reason is because I want to make sure I present something enjoyable to consume and semi-realistic. If I watched other videos, their theories would taint mine and my videos would just be kind of samey. That has a negative effect though, in the fact that I don't know if what I'm talking about has already been proven verifiably wrong or going on the assumption that it's been proven one way or another. While I hope you liked my video, I guarantee not everything is 100% accurate in it. There is a lot of speculation and to be fair, much of FromSoft lore is speculation. Why channels like Vadividia are bringing the gospel and if you like this video, you should definitely check him out. He does a lot more speculation than I think people realize, but I'm getting off topic. My video, while entertaining, might not stand the test of time, but what I hope is that the comments do. Please feel free to add speculation and proven facts in the comments. I love reading them, and I've got to be honest, writing this video, while super fun and honestly very thrilling, is kind of sad. I wanted to talk about these theories all over the internet, but I couldn't because someone who is much better at editing and writing than me would have made like five videos on this before I could. So I had to keep my mouth shut. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. And if you did, you might enjoy my Kenshi video. It goes down a similar rabbit hole in the world of Kenshi. You can watch it by clicking here or whatever my latest work is by clicking here. Bye bye